Hi, it's Dwyer, richarddwyer.com, keepingitfree.blogspot.com, and of course, gamblersadvisory.com. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. It is Thursday, November the 22nd, 2018. In the other room, you might hear my family. They're cooking turkey and all that other good stuff. I'll join them shortly. But let's talk about the murder conviction of Sabrina Lamone. Right? But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let me just say, there's a very troubling, at least to me, area of the law that deserves your attention. Because I believe it leads to unreliable verdicts. I want you to think about the people around you with whom you have a deep emotional relationship. That list, depending on your situation, might include your spouse, your lover, your child, your parent, your close friend or neighbor. Now, I believe it is just a fact of life, especially if you watch Oxygen and ID, uh, Discovery ID. I think it's just a fact of life that these are the people who are most likely to try to hurt you if they feel wronged. Right again, your spouse, your lover, your child, your parent, your close friend or neighbor. Now in the law, we have a concept of a conspiracy. Now that's an agreement between two or more people to commit a criminal act. And it's some step taken by any of the co-conspirators toward that goal. In the law, we also have the concept of felony murder, right? Let's say you and I, we're committing a felony. For example, robbing a bank. Someone gets killed in the commission of that felony. Under the law, we're both liable for murder, right? Even if one or both of us were just in it to rob the bank not to commit a murder. So, getaway drivers are guilty of murder that happens during a bank robbery, even though they were not in the bank at the time the murder was committed, right? They're part of the plot to rob the bank. They're part of the felony. Someone gets killed in furtherance of that felony. Guess what? They're liable for murder. So, let's pivot here. It's important. Let's ask the question, who are the people in your life who know your secrets? If I were a prosecutor and I asked you, who have you told where your spouse works? Who have you given that address to or mentioned the building? Right? Who have you said, my spouse works downtown at the police station, or my spouse works at AT&T's office on 5th Street. Who is the person you've given or people you've given that information to? If you're having an affair, I believe the answer would be your lover. Right? If you're in a family setting, you might have told your child, your parent, or you might have shared that news with your close friend or neighbor. Now, what happens when that person does something stupid or even criminal with the secret you've shared? Now, if you innocently told them your secret, let's say we're at a barbecue, and I tell my neighbor, you know, my wife works at the police station downtown, right? If it's an innocent conversation, 
then you wouldn't be part of a conspiracy, would you? If it's pillow talk, if I'm cheating on my wife and I have an affair, and I'm just having pillow talk with my mistress, and I say to her, you know, my wife works on Fifth Street, right? If that's an innocent statement that's not made in furtherance of any criminal activity, well, that's just pillow talk. Wouldn't it take the prosecutor a lot to prove otherwise? If you're emotionally involved with someone, right? If they're a mistress or a mister, if you're in a multi-month, maybe multi-year relationship with someone, they're certainly gonna know things about you and your situation other than your name, aren't they? Right, they might know about your job. They might know about, if it's an affair, your spouse. The things you like in that marriage, the things you don't like in that marriage. Basic stuff, like what your spouse does, where he or she works. So the million dollar question here for this case, in my eyes, is if they use the information to do something terrible, should you be guilty of any kind of conspiracy claim or of the crime itself? Now this brings me to Sabrina Lamone, a housewife with kids in her mid thirties in Silver Lakes, California. She was married to Robert Lamone. The couple were swingers. They followed a protocol. Right? They were only to be fooling around with people that the other spouse approved of. Right? So Sabrina Lamone was sleeping with 26 year old Jonathan Hearn. It got intense. Her husband asked her to break it off. She told him she did. She did not. Right? So she's having an affair. I'll agree. She's guilty of having an affair. Right? But here's what we know for certain. On August 17th, 2014, Jonathan Hearn drove his motorcycle to Robert Lamone's workplace. Lamone worked alone. Hearn knew the address and he knew that Lamone worked alone from his lover, Sabrina Lamone, Robert's wife. Hearn parks his bike. He puts on a mask. In other words, this is not flippant. This is planned. Hearn is at the workplace with tools. Right? He puts on a mask. He fakes a limp. He's wearing an overcoat on a warm day to hide his body. Right? He's caught on surveillance video, but the surveillance video sees a guy in a mask with a limp. He limps into Lamone's work area where he shoots Lamone to death before leaving. Now this case might have some mysteries, but the identity of the person who shoots Robert Lamone is not a mystery. It's known. It's Jonathan Hearn, the guy who was sleeping with Lamone's wife. So as you can imagine, there are texts over the months between Sabrina Lamone and Jonathan Hearn, her lover. And the texts contain the kind of things that texts between lovers contain. 
right? None of the texts, none of them, say, kill my husband. None of the texts, and I mean none of them, say, I'm going to kill your husband, right? None of them. Now let's bend over backwards here to try to accommodate the prosecution's theory of the case, right? There is a text message in which Hearn recommends that Lamone read Psalm 38 and Psalm 51, right? You're sleeping with someone, you're exchanging texts with them, they start making biblical references in the text. How seriously do you take that? Well, the prosecution in this case wanted the jury to understand that the passages refer to King David's lust for Bathsheba, the wife of one of his most devout soldiers, right? Apparently Bathsheba and David later had an affair that resulted in a pregnancy while her guy Uriah was away. David then arranged for Uriah to be killed. So the prosecution wants you to believe that his references to Psalm 38 and Psalm 51 and attacks were supposed to lead Sabrina Lamone to know that Hearn was the person who killed her husband, right? I'll leave it up to you as to whether you think the reference to a biblical text gives someone proper notice or is evidence of some kind of conspiracy. Well, let's continue. There are no texts that say, kill my husband or I'm going to kill your husband. Nothing like that. Right? In my opinion, none of them. So after the murders take after the murder takes place, both Hearn and Sabrina Lamone get arrested. Both of them. She ultimately gets released due to insufficient evidence. Right? Now understand it's after Hearn who remains in prison. They, they know that he pulled up with his bike. They have pictures of the bike, right, leaving the murder scene. They know it's his bike. They look at the person limping. They figure out that it's Hearn. So they have more evidence on Hearn. It's after Hearn sits in prison for two years, two years, that he suddenly has a change of heart. And for the first time, the first time, claims that his lover, Sabrina, was part of his conspiracy to kill her husband. Now, the prosecution seized on the fact that Lamone told her lover, Hearn, where her husband worked. They claimed that that was part of the conspiracy. The fact that she said to him, you know, he works here. The fact that she discussed with him that he apparently worked alone. Right? They also point out that she had something like $300,000 in life insurance. Now, based on this evidence, if you want to call it that, and Hearn's testimony that, yes, she was in it with me. A jury convicted Lamone of first-degree murder. She's now serving 25 years to life. Now, let me just tell you, it's my opinion that the jury got this one wrong. Right? I thought in the United States you needed proof beyond a reasonable doubt. 
In my opinion, the evidence here could not be thinner. Understand there's no forensic evidence that ties what Jonathan Hearn did to Sabrina Lamont. Right? None. He rides his bike there. He has a costume he's bought. He goes in, he kills her husband. Right? In my opinion, Hearn is a lover who is upset that his girlfriend is married. Right? Lamone won't leave her husband. Right? Lamone's the wife who strays, but who also stays. Right? Now, understand, in my opinion, the fact that he's in prison for two years, the fact that he doesn't, the day he's arrested, say, She's in it with me, right? Here's the evidence that shows she's in it with me. The fact that he waits two years and the fact that he cuts a deal, I'm not kidding, for a reduced sentence with the prosecution, right? That's contingent on him showing up in court and implicating in her, her in the crime indicates to me that he's a weak witness, Right? I'm sorry. Witnesses who receive things for their testimony aren't the most credible. Right? Witnesses who wait two years before they come up with a story, and of course the story ends up helping them get out of jail earlier, aren't credible to me. I'm surprised this guy was deemed as credible, this murderer was deemed as credible by this jury. Let me say too that Sometimes the people who hurt you are the people who love you. Right? Look at all of these crime shows. People know when a married person gets killed, the cops immediately suspect their spouse. Right? You show me an elder abuse case, and I'm going to show you a case where someone's child or grandchild or some caretaker who was hired to take care of the elderly person is abusing that relationship. In other words, the person close to the victim is the one who did the crime. Now here it's clear to me that Hearn is mad at Sabrina Lamone because she was released from prison. Meanwhile, he is serving time alone. In my opinion, he fell in love with her, did something stupid, and now wants her to share in his pain, right? In my opinion, this is his version of payback, right? He's upset that she's married. She won't leave her husband with whom she has kids. She has a house. They're still living together. They're not separated. She won't leave her husband. He then does something stupid, sees her out living her life while he's in prison, and then comes up with this story two years later. Let me also say this too. People hear about a $300,000 life insurance policy and they say, oh my goodness, that's the motive. You know, people with kids will think about getting life insurance. Especially in a situation like this, where the guy is the breadwinner. Right? The family is going to say, well, whoa, you know, guy or woman's the breadwinner. The other spouse is going to say, well, what happens if something happens to the breadwinner? We need to be taken care of. Right? The life insurance industry exists for a reason. I can't say I'm surprised that a married couple in their 30s with kids would consider getting and then get life insurance. Let me also say this too. All of the evidence, all of it, points to the fact that Robert Lamone was a great dad. Now this couple lived in California, right? A state, community property state that will give both sides consideration in a divorce. 
So understand, had the Lamones gotten a divorce, Sabrina Lamone would have gotten child support and would have gotten spousal support, right? And her kids would have still had access to their great dad, who Sabrina Lamone herself testified she loved. Right? This was a woman having an affair. This was not a woman leaving her husband. One man's opinion. So, I believe this is a sour grapes case with high stakes. Right? Sabrina Lamone was having an affair. The affair lasted months. No doubt she learned a lot about Jonathan Hearn, the guy she was fooling around with, the younger guy she's fooling around with. No doubt he learned a lot about her, including who her husband was, where he worked, whether there was a crowd there when he worked. Right? Pillow talk is part of relationships. I don't believe pillow talk should serve as the grounds for a murder conviction. Let me also say too that you're texting someone and you're throwing out the usual stuff, right? It's an affair. You say, hey, I can't wait to see you again, babe. Oh, the other night was spectacular and stuff like that. Then the other person texts back, you know, think about Psalms this and that. I'm telling you, a lot of us are just going to say, oh, okay, I understand that the person I'm fooling around with is religious. All right. All right. Right? A lot of us getting a text on a phone are not going to then put down the phone and run to a Bible to actually look up the Psalms. Right? You're going to think to yourself, wow, this sounds odd. I'll just ask my lover about this the next time I see her. Right? The fact that Jonathan Hearn is quoting Psalms to me isn't enough for me to reach the conclusion that, oh my God, he quoted Psalm 38, so she had to know. She had to know that he had killed her husband. Right? I, I'm just not buying it. So let me just say this, and I'll end with this. When I see these conspiracy cases where one person isn't even at the murder scene where the entire prosecution hinges on the word of a stone cold killer a person who actually hopped on a bike brought a disguise with them traveled to a father's workplace then shoots the guy in cold blood, right? For the sole reason of getting with his wife and replacing him in the wife's life. When some guy like that is your key witness, his story can't be corroborated with any text messages or any correspondence or any written note of any kind. Right? And when the guy doesn't come up with this story for the first two years of his incarceration, I have a lot of doubt. I feel that doubt is reasonable. Right? I see a woman with kids having an affair who's still living with hubby. Right? Who's together with hubby. Who's in video celebrating hubby's birthday just a few days before hubby gets killed by the guy she's sleeping with. And I'm not convinced that that woman wanted to change her life. I think Sabrina Lamone, if she's guilty of anything, it's wanting to have an affair while staying with her husband and kids. Right? That's her crime. It's not murder in the first degree. I don't see the planning here. I just don't believe Jonathan Hearn, right? A guy who's fooling around with a married woman who then decides he's going to kill her husband who doesn't have any written evidence whatsoever to prove any complicity of the wife 
to me isn't enough if I'm a juror. Let me hear from you. I understand Sabrina Lamone is trying now to appeal the conviction, which I think is an absurd verdict. Let me hear your thoughts. I hope you Google this case. Unfortunately, this case follows a pattern that's going to fit some of the other crimes here that I talk about online going forward, where someone who does a terrible thing is able to then say, you know what, reduce my sentence, and I'll implicate this other person so I can get out of jail early. Right? It's a sad pattern in American jurisprudence, and it's sad because when you show up to trial, you want to be able to challenge the forensics. You want to be able to say, look, I wasn't there. I knew nothing about this. The problem is here, you show up at trial, you say, I wasn't there. The prosecution says, we know you weren't there. We know who killed your husband. We don't have anything in writing that shows that you knew about this beforehand. But we do have, of all the people in the world, the killer's testimony. And he's telling us that you were involved. And if you don't accept our plea deal, we're going to shame you in front of a jury of your neighbors by pointing out that you were a swinger having an affair, taboo behavior that doesn't equal murder. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.